chapter 4 this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> Every year, since we are beginning the uh, new year, this is the last Sunday we'll have before the new year begins. Every year, uh, about 90 or about 45 percent of, uh, of Americans come up with some sort of New Year's resolution. Something that they're going to change this year. They make one or more New Year's resolutions. Uh, they're going to change some habit, uh, some lifestyle. Uh, um, amongst the uh, top 10 New Year's resolutions, the, the top five that people tend to make are to uh, lose weight, exercise more, stop smoking, stop drinking, get out of debt. We make these kinds of resolutions. The problem is that uh, even though about 45% of Americans make New Year's resolutions, statistically, statistically, 97% of them fail miserably. Uh, I know this uh, uh, as, a, as a fact because I, I tend to go to the gym. I try to go to the gym about three times a week. And uh, in January, you can't get a treadmill to save your life. You go in and they're all, the, all the newbies are in there and they're, all, they're, they're taking up all the exercise equipment. And it's not even worth going in January. By Valentine's Day, it's empty. You don't have to worry about it because they've all given up and they've quit. Because 97% of people give up on their New Year's resolutions. Um, their life is left unchanged. And even more significantly, there are many people, scores of folks, who claim Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Who at some point in their life made a profession of faith in Christ and said, I'm going to be different. My life is going to change at this point. I'm going to, I, I, I profess Christ as my Savior and I'm going to be a different person. And then they don't change. And it's become so commonplace that we accept it as a normal thing for a person to declare themselves a Christian, to declare that they've become a follower of Jesus Christ, and yet they still talk like the world and drink like the world and have unmarried sex like the world and rage at people like the world and divorce like the world and do business like the world and treat other people like the world treats other people and yet they claim that they have been delivered from the world. They claim to be different and yet they persist in behaving like the world. And taking these patterns down to a very, very personal level for us this morning, I, I dare say that there are those amongst us this morning in this congregation who are still struggling, agonizing with weaknesses and habits and sinful patterns and addictions that you had back in your pre-Christian days that you have brought into your Christian Life. And even though you may have been a Christian for months or even years, your life remains unchanged. Why is that? What is, what is missing that your life has not changed? So this morning I want us to hear from the Word of God on the subject of the power to change. The power to change. This morning, I want to show you that God has given you resources. Resources by which you can break free from those fleshly patterns that grip you. And Ephesians chapter 4 talks specifically about this issue. Earlier in Ephesians, he talks about the fact that, uh, that we, we should walk worthy of the high calling that has been placed upon uh, our life. The, this phrase kind of pictures a, a scale in which uh, on one side you put everything that Jesus has done for you, what Christ has provided for you. And in order to balance that scale on the other side, we need to walk worthy of what He has done for us. We need to behave. Our lives need to reflect even our thoughts and our attitudes or should all be an outworking of what Christ has already done for us us. And if we are walking worthy of the high calling, 
that Christ has placed upon our lives. There are going to be some things that are true about us. We're going to be humble rather than self-centered. We're going to be gentle rather than argumentative. We're going to be patient. We're going to be the kind of people who generate harmony around us. And so many of our sinful habits and patterns that we, we uh, brought into our Christian lives, we're going to see these things begin to evaporate. So how do we become like this? How do we change? How do we transform? I'm going to suggest this morning that we're going to find some of our answers in taking a little journey here in verses 7 through 10 of uh, Ephesians chapter 4 in which the apostle speaks to us about uh, a, a period of time uh, after Christ's death and then his resurrection and, and what Christ has done for us and how those things that he has done for us can help us change our lives, break our addictions, change the kinds of attitudes and thoughts that we have so that we can be different that we finally can change. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, he says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. <coughs> Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <coughs> we thank you that Christ has given us wonderful, beautiful gifts. We ask, Lord, that we would walk worthy of the high calling that has been placed in our lives. <coughs> that, Lord, we would live out these gifts that he has given to us. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. So as we're talking about this power to change, I want to begin by establishing some very important principles. And the first principle I want to establish, number one principle, is that every Christian can and should change. We should change. Let me ask you a question. When you go to buy something, do you like getting extra? Do you, do you like getting more than what you paid for? Uh, this year for, for Christmas, we bought our granddaughter a, a membership to the zoo. It was kind of neat. She, she got a membership so she can go to the zoo whenever she wants to. But the first time they went to the zoo, <coughs> first time they used it, when they went in, they gave her not only her zoo membership card, but they also gave her a couple of stuffed animals. Uh, some more than what we paid for. We got something extra. I remember years ago when I was in college, I used to uh, do photography to bring in some extra money, and uh, I needed a little better camera, and I, I upgraded uh, to a, a, a nicer uh, SLR camera, a single lens reflex camera, and I, I, I went and bought this thing I'd saved for quite a while. And I remember when I bought it, the guy at the camera store threw in a tripod and a, a camera bag and even a coffee mug. I remember I, I was so thrilled because I, I got more than I expected. I got extra. He threw in some things I hadn't bargained for. Folks, when you come to know Christ as your Savior, Christ gives you more than you bargained for. He gives you things that you may not have expected. Not only does He give you heaven and eternal life, Christ throws in some extras as well. He throws in some grace gifts. He gives you something very special because along with saving grace, He also gives you serving Grace. Verse 7 says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. To every true believer, Christ gives us the capacity, the enabling, the supernatural ability to minister grace to others. He works in you so that you become a conduit, a channel of the grace of God into the lives of other people. So that when you are saved, God has reworked you. Christ has reworked you through the working of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He has made over your inner self so that you can make an effective and significant impact for the kingdom of God. And he even makes this very personal. It's very personalized. This is a grace gift <coughs> that was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Jesus tailors every grace gift that he gives you to fit who you are. 
So the, the reworking, the, the change, the transformation that He makes over inside you fits perfectly who you are so that when you minister these grace gifts, there's no strain on you. It meshes with your unique personality and it brings about not only the, the, the glory of God and the advancement of the kingdom, but it also brings joy into your life as well as you minister these grace gifts to other people. So the scripture is saying that every Christian can and should change. When you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God, you are made a new creation. You are transformed. You are made different. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You are given supernatural gifts. You are made over in your inner person. You are different than you were before, so you can and you should change. You should transform. There's a story about two caterpillars who are sitting on a leaf and they're having lunch and a butterfly flies overhead and one of the caterpillars looks up and he says, you'll never get me up in one of those things. Well, folks, caterpillars don't choose whether or not they're going to change, do they? No, it is built into them from the inside out. <coughs> folks, like a caterpillar, you are made... To change. A caterpillar doesn't vote about whether it's going to become a butterfly. It doesn't try on a, a cocoon to see if it fits. A caterpillar transforms because that is its nature. That is its essence. And in the same way, you, a believer in Christ, have been changed from the inside out. God has equipped you uniquely to minister for the kingdom of God. He meant you to fly. He meant for you to become something different. He meant for you to experience an abundant life that will glorify God in everything that you do. So anytime you hear someone claim that they're a Christian and say that, you know, I, I, I know I haven't changed, I know I'm not different, but I can't help who I am, I've, I've tried, it just doesn't work for me, there's a disconnect there somewhere. Either, either they're confused or they're unconverted, but there's something wrong in their walk with Christ. So think of that place in your life where you struggle repeatedly, where you have failed, that thing that, that you need to change, that thing that needs to be transformed. And to yourself, I want you to say this, I want to say, God is not finished with me. I can change. I can change. Every Christian can change. Second principle. <coughs> our change, our transformation was secured by Jesus Himself. Now you're going to have to bear with me a minute here because it's going to look like I'm chasing a rabbit, but I'm not. It's, it's important here for us to understand uh, what, what is at the very heart of our transformation into Christ-likeness. In verse 8, the apostle takes up a quote from Psalm 68. He's quoting the Old Testament here. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now we cannot really understand what's, what's going on here unless we grasp the fact that, David, uh, that uh, Paul is quoting David in Psalm 68. And David is probably writing a psalm here. He's written a psalm in Psalm 68, probably on the occasion of his conquering Jerusalem. He took Jerusalem away from the Jebusites. And so what he's doing is he's giving us a, a picture. He's, he's giving, using imagery that he would have experienced from the ancient Near East whenever a king conquered another city. Now what he would do when he conquered another city is he would return to his own hometown, his own city, and there would be a parade. And as he came into the city, he would lead the parade, the king would lead the parade, and behind him there would be rank and rank and file, uh, row upon row of, of soldiers, his own soldiers in battle array, marching behind him, probably singing as they went. And then behind them, there would be the conquered soldiers, those who had been beaten and defeated, and they would be in chains and in rags, and they would be in hum humiliated, and they would be following in the parade, and behind them would be the conquered king, the one who had been defeated. And then behind that, there would be 
uh, livestock, herds of livestock that had been taken as spoil. And behind that, there'd be wagon loads of all the gold and silver and, and jewels and all the precious things that they had taken as spoils of war. And then after they finished the parade, the king would go through the spoils, all the things that he, he had brought into the city, and he would give gifts to those who had helped him. To the soldiers, they would receive gifts. To the, the leading people of the city, they would receive gifts. All those who were in the king's favor would receive gifts. Part of the spoils of war here. And so what he's saying here in, in Ephesians chapter 4, he's saying that Christ has won a great victory over a formidable foe. He is leading a procession. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Our Lord has fought and won a great battle. He took the full force of the world's sin and death. He contended with, with Satan and his armies. And the final battle, the final battle culminated on a hill outside of Jerusalem where Jesus, pursuing the most, most remarkable strategy imaginable, something that, that we could not have even comprehended that he would have done, he died in order to win our victory. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He took the full wrath of God. He experienced our death in our place. And in response to this, Colossians 2.15 tells us that God has disarmed the rulers and authorities, the demonic powers and forces of this world. He has disgraced them publicly and He has triumphed over them in this victory parade. King Jesus has won our victory. And He says that He has given gifts to the people. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Gifts of serving grace to every believer as a token of His triumph. He has fulfilled God's will. He has broken sin's power. He has defeated Satan. He has won the battle. And He has proclaimed His victory to all those who love Him. And now He is distributing the spoils of His victory. You're saying, well, okay, I get it. Jesus won. But how does that help me to change? Which leads me to the last principle here. It's time for us to act on the truth that Christ has given us victory. That Christ has distributed to us grace gifts, not only salvation, but serving gifts as well. All of us see, see, uh, have seen what happens when, when it rains uh, really hard. Water always seeks its lowest level. And uh, when it rains really hard, a, a little bit of water will, will dig a little bit of a trench because it'll all funnel into the lowest place and it'll dig a little trench. Uh, a little more water will, will dig a pretty good sized ditch. You let it go on long enough with enough water and you got a riverbed, don't you? How do you stop water? How do you stop water from flowing to its lowest point? You build a dam. You dam it up. Folks, sin is like that. Sin will always uh, seek its lowest level. How do you, how do you stop sin from, from traveling down a well-worn path in our life, beating a path, a trench, a riverbed through our lives? How do you stop that? You stop it by building a dam. With what? Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. 
We are called to walk in a new way of life. And the way we break free from the, uh, the dominating power of sin in our life is by recognizing that Christ has given us the victory. Christ Jesus has accomplished something on the cross and that accomplishment applies to me and my life. We are in Christ. He died for our sins and since He died, we died as well. And since He was raised, we've been raised as well. To a new life, we've been raised victorious. We've been raised to be different. Well, Pastor, can you cut to the bottom line here? How, how does all this enable me to change? How does it make me become like Christ? Well, this is the thing, folks. You are linked to Christ in what He has won. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10 describe the moment in history when your spiritual transformation was accomplished. When Christ won the victory... Your change, your transformation was accomplished. It was a done deal. It was guaranteed. Well, pastor, if that's true, how come I fail so much? When the Holy Spirit comes to indwell in us, He brings all the power, all the strength, all the tools we need to be different. Here's the key, though. We have to cooperate with Him. We have to cooperate with Him. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible tells us that, that uh, we have a choice every day. We have a choice every day. Are we going to be led, guided, carried along by the Holy Spirit of God and His direction? Or are we going to be led, carried along, and, and directed by the desires of the flesh? The Bible says as a believer in Christ, you have a choice every day. Every minute of every day, you have a choice. Who is going to be the lead dog? Who is going to guide you? Who's going to direct you? Who's going to drag you along? Is it going to be the Spirit or is it going to be your flesh? And here's the thing. Too many of us choose the flesh. It's time for us to build a dam and say, no more. I'm going to be different. I have all the resources I need in Christ if I'll just draw near to Him. If I'll just spend time in the Word of God, if I'll just spend time in worship, if I'll be devoted to Christ, the Bible says if you will draw near to Him, He will draw near to you. And He will bring every resource that you need. But we have to decide which one's going to lead. Are we going to make use of all that Christ has purchased for us on the cross? Are we going to avail ourselves of all those resources that He has purchased on the cross? All the gifts that He has distributed to us, all the power and the strength that He provides for us, are we going to do that or are we going to live according to the flesh? Folks, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, there really is no option. Christ says, be holy even as I am holy. Follow the direction and guidance of the Spirit. Make 2019 different than 2018. Folks, we're coming up on the, the time of the invitation here. The invitation this morning is, is very, very simple. In what way is 2019 going to be different than 2018? How are you going to be more like Christ this year than you were last year? Because I promise you this, you have every resource you need. Christ has given you every gift you need to be different. If we'll just avail ourselves of it. If we'll build that dam and say, this far and no farther. I'm not walking in sin anymore. I'm going to live differently. I'm going to be a different person this year than I was last year. 97% of people fail in their New Year's resolutions. You know why? Because they just don't have the power and strength in themselves to do it. The good news is, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have every 
heavenly blessing and gift you need to be a different person. Maybe you're here this morning you don't know Christ as your Savior. You're thinking, I could never change. I could never be different. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you, you're right. You don't have the strength, the power, the gifts that you need. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, the problem that you've been having is not that you haven't availed yourself of the gifts, but that you just aren't a follower of Christ. Maybe that's your problem. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus and received the free gift of salvation that He offers us. The Bible says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God for eternity in a place called hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. Maybe what you need today is to receive Christ as your personal Savior and be transformed and be made different. Maybe that's what you need today. Or maybe you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You know Christ is your Savior, but you need to begin availing yourself of the gifts and the power and the strength that Christ has given you to change and be that different person this year. During this time of invitation, do business with God. Let's ask God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to be different in this next year? And let's be different. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.